On October 13, 1972, a plane carrying 45 passengers, including an entire professional rugby team, crashed in the Andes Mountain between Chile and Argentina. There was no way the survivors could have known it at the time, but their nightmares had only just begun. Their story has been called the Miracle of the Andes because of the incredible odds. The survivors of UUA in Air Force Flight 571 had to overcome tremendous odds to make it home. We're going to look at the true story behind the movie Alive and the crash of UUA Flight 571 in the Andes. But before we get started, subscribe to our channel and let us know in the comments below what other unbelievable survivor stories you would like to hear about. The rugby team aboard Flight 571 wasn't terribly alarmed when the pilot told them they were about to encounter some turbulence. They were en route to a Chile match and most had their minds on the coming game. But at least one of the passengers, a 19-year-old medical student named Robert Casa, recalled someone near him asking if they were flying too close to the mountains. Moments later, and his fear was realized when the plane hit the side of a mountain. The crash was later attributed to turbulence the pilot hit while still flying high. Amongst the Andes Mountains, the pilot turned north to begin the descent into Santiago, Chile. However, the peaks were still too high and they realized this mistake. The pilot attempted to increase the altitude by, by tilting the plane nearly fully vertical, which caused the plane to stall. The engine sputtered and the plane descended, and that's when it hit the mountain. Dr. Roberto Canso detailed exactly how he felt after the plane hit the mountain. He reported that his body lurched forward upon impact and immediately struck his head. His first thought was that his life was about to end. He held on tight to his seat and began praying. Someone nearby yelled, Please, God, help me! Help me! While another person shouted that he was blind. When KSA looked over at the screaming passenger, he saw that the man's brain was literally spilling out of his head. When the plane stopped, the passengers screamed as their seats fell forward like a row of dominoes toward the cockpit. The crash split the fuselage of the plane wide open. It broke apart and the tail was nowhere in sight. The rugby team and their friends and family aboard the flight found themselves stranded, surrounded by snow-capped mountains amid a raging blizzard. After the crash, the team gathered whatever food and warm clothes they could find in the wreckage, convinced that a rescue mission would arrive quickly. They took their empty suitcase and used them to make a cross on the ground they believed would be easily visible from the sky. They also used their footsteps to carve out an SOS message in the snow for planes that might be flying overhead. On the second day, they heard a jet and a smaller plane fly over them. Both times, the survivors became elated, feeling sure that a rescue was imminent. But day after day came and went with no sign of help. 571 took off with 45 people aboard. 12 of those perished in the crash, and five more succumbed to injuries within hours. Another person died one week later from injuries sustained in the crash. And on the 17th day, disaster struck again. A sudden avalanche swept over the crash site where another eight people met their demise. The survivors lacked food, which made starvation their number one concern. However, they were also trapped at an altitude of 11,800 feet, meaning their second biggest problem was the unrelenting freezing temperatures. To stay alive, the survivors of Flight 571 had to get clever to get drinking water. They used a section of aluminum from one of the plane seats to melt the snow. They also needed to stay warm, so they disassembled all the wool seat covers to form blankets. Walking around in the deep snow wasn't easy, so they figured out they could use seat bottoms as snowshoes. They used the fuselage as shelter, and to block the cold air from getting inside, they packed suitcases into the open spaces. Sunglasses were fabricated from plastic that was found in the pilot's cabin. Hammocks were constructed for people with broken legs, and sleeping bags were made from insulation pulled from the plane's kitchen. 
When it came to bodily functions, the survivors would urinate into rugby balls, because if they tried to do it outside in the snow, their urine would freeze. Roberto Casa, a young medical student at the time, used his developing skills to nurse the injured. He drained fluids and stabilized fractured bones. He also assumed responsibility for moving the corpses, a job some couldn't bring themselves to do. In an interview with National Geographic, Dr. Casa later reflected on the ingenuity of the survivors, saying that you get very smart when dying. Nine days after the crash, the food ran out. The land around the crash site had no vegetation and there were no animals at that altitude either. So hunting or foraging was out of the question. With nothing sustaining them, it was only a few days before they were all feeling the symptoms of starvation. The survivors knew that if they waited too long to eat, they would only have two weeks to survive. They were also aware that the bodies of the deceased passengers lay preserved in the packed snow, not too far from the fuselage. So it didn't take long to realize the only option. Many of the survivors resisted, and some of them prayed to God, asking for guidance as to whether or not they should resort to eating their fellow passengers and teammates. There was, also, there was plenty of discussion among the team, but starvation led to action. As a medical student, Roberto Casa knew that human tissue contains proteins and fats like any other meat. He knew that it would be sufficient to sustain the starving survivors, and as the closest thing they had to a doctor, he felt confident about being the first to cut into one of the corpses. In his memoir, Casa would later write about the mental barrier he encountered when he tried to consume the flesh of his friend, it was one thing to know at an intellectual level that you were hungry and needed food to live, but it was another thing entirely to know that the so-called food in one's hand is from the body of a loved one. The experience for the survivors was, needless to say, unbelievably stressful. Casa used a sort of glass to slice into the first body, and each survivor took a piece forcing themselves to consume it on the spot. Every survivor, except one, the coach, he initially refused to take part as he could not stomach the idea. Eventually though, even he gave in to his innate desire to stay alive. Technically speaking, what the survivors did is not cannibalism per se. The term usually refers to the devious means to consume a person. What the survivors did is actually known as Anji. Despite the pedantic, the survivors realized the severity of their actions and vowed to consider it a sacred act of, of the then ten remaining. They deemed three of them off limits. Those were the bodies of Fernando Parados, mother and sister, and JVE, and Matal, the nephew. Essa and the other survivors think that if the situation were reversed, they would want their bodies to be used as food. Because of this, all of the survivors had a hard time with the idea of eating someone else. Casa felt eating another person connected the two physically and spiritually, all in agreement. The survivors vowed that if they perished, they would willingly donate themselves, so the others could live during the avalanche that hit on the 17th day. The frozen bodies the team lived off of were all swept away. During the avalanche that hit on the 17th day, the frozen bodies the team lived off of were all swept away. However, the avalanche also resulted in the loss of eight additional passengers. After talking with Essa and the others for a while, the survivors had to decide whether or not to eat their friends who had been alive and breathing just hours before. Once again, they decided to do what they must to survive, and they fed off the newly lost passengers. Though they were stranded, the team wasn't totally cut off from the outside world. They used transistor radio to hear about the search efforts to find them, but on October 23, 1972, they heard some gravely distressing news. After over 100 attempts to locate the crashed plane, the authorities called off the search. The survivors realized that if they were going to make it home, they would have to get help themselves. Soon afterward, Canna, Nato Parado, and Antonio Tintin set out on a hike to find rescue. They made it to the top of the mountain. Still, they knew right away that they were still long away from safety. That Canna and Parado could figure out how to split their small amount of food, ten were taken back to the plane. At night, 
they endured sub-zero temperatures, but after 10 days of walking, they reached a spot with grass and water. They suddenly felt confident that they were going to survive. Hanna and Parado hiked 10 days and 44 miles before they finally found someone who could help them. It was 70 days after the initial crash. The two led authorities to the crash site, where they finally emerged back into civilization. The rest of the survivors were saved, considering their severe malnutrition and the incredibly dangerous terrain. The odds they survived were nothing short of astonishing. On December 22, 1972, two helicopters were sent to find the survivors still living in the plane. Wreckage 6 was immediately flown home, but eight others had to wait until the next day due to poor weather conditions. The rescue made all the headlines, but reactions quickly shifted from joyous amazement to shock and disgust. When word got out about what the team had to do to survive, it wasn't until the survivors were able to express their own hesitations about their actions. They also described the spiritual battle that ensued over the decision that the public was swayed to support them. It was especially troubling that the church took issue with the survivors' actions. However, once they explained that they had treated the consumption of their friends as an act of communion, the church absolved them of their sins. After the rescue, Canna set out to meet the parents of all those who perished. He took the letters the dead had written before they passed away. He felt strongly about telling the survivors' side of the story and ensuring their circumstances of their plight were all well understood. Casa knew how taboo what they had done was, and he believed no one could be more outraged than those of the families of the deceased, but in the end, he found he was met with understanding and forgiveness from the victims' families. They all seemed to understand living was more important than anything else. 